Hello there, friends. It's me, your old pal, Captain Kevin of the Attitude Era podcast, How to Wrestling Cinema Swirl. It's Raw, Kevin Underground, SmackDown Crawl, all that other stuff that I do. I'm very excited to talk to you today about something I don't really get often an opportunity to speak on, which is my history, my relationship, and my fandom of total non-stop action wrestling, or NWA TNA, as it was known when I first clocked eyes on that company many, many years ago. I mean, I think TNA came around for me, like a lot of folks based in Ireland or the UK, on the wrestling channel back in the kind of mid-2000s. And I do remember something very particular about that time. It was that I think I was the only person in my school, in my social circles, even in my anti-social circles, that was still watching wrestling. You know, I went from the heyday. I remember when I first went to school, it was WrestleMania 17. It felt like everyone was into wrestling. I went from being, you know, the only kid in primary school who knew who mankind was to going to a secondary school where all the older boys all loved wrestling and everyone talked about wrestling. Even teachers knew about wrestling. And then the years went on. Brock Lesnar came in. I was in a rugby school. Everyone was obsessed with him. And then that kind of went away. And then all of a sudden I was left on my own some. I would have no one to talk to about pay-per-views. I would have no one to kind of opine on anything to do with wrestling. And it became quite a lonely time to be a wrestling fan because it was always a very sociable thing for me. And then enter in the Sky Digibox and the wrestling channel. And I'm not going to lie, I had always been very snobbish about you know, types of indie wrestling. I was a WWE kid through and through. I thought WCW was uh, poison when I was 15 years old. And a lot of the stuff on the wrestling channel didn't grab me initially because I felt it was like, it seemed low budget or it felt like it wasn't proper. And then I saw this show where they were giving me three hour pay-per-views every week. And by hook or by crook, they were trying to give you a pay-per-view quality show. There was over-the-top stipulations. There were names that I absolutely adored who had disappeared from the WWE and were now in, like, world title situations. I'm talking about seeing Rhino and Raven battling over, you know, NWA Championship, Jeff Jarrett being there, you know, people like Sting being alluded to. Hey, Team 3D, those old deadly boys have shown up. So, you know, it, for me, it was a safe haven. These are all these people I thought were no longer involved in the world of wrestling. But low-key, the best thing that was happening that entire time It was introducing me to this whole other world. I don't even know if that was NWA TNA's idea at the time, but that was my ticket to finally seeing things like Ring of Honor, CMLL, you know, finding out about wrestlers from other worlds, knowing that indie wrestling wasn't just this outlaw mud show rinky-dink thing that I saw beyond the mat. It was actually producing some of the best wrestlers in the world. Honestly, one of the most iconic moments I could ever think of when I was watching wrestling at all during those years was seeing Samoa Joe for the first time hearing Mike Tanea an announcer I'd never really heard of an announcer like that just go on about this guy's credibility and this promotion he came from and he won their pure championship and he had a towel and he was really serious I got to see Sabu I got to see Sandman I got to see Jeff Jarrett on top of the world It was honestly the most boo-boo bananas, balls-to-the-wall wrestling show I'd ever seen at that time. And I was excited because I got one of these shows every single week. You know, I would see new guys like Abyss and go, oh my God, look, why isn't WWE signing him? Or I'd see someone like Don Callis and be like, oh my God, how come he's never gotten to be a big talker in anywhere other than ECW up until this point? Or I saw like Eric Watts and I go, wow, that's one of the worst wrestlers I've ever seen in my life. This is amazing. And... I've always loved the kind of shit side of wrestling, you know, where things are kind of falling apart and things aren't quite how they seem. I'm not going to lie to you, TNA, particularly in those early days, was never the all singing, all dancing, absolute five out of five knockout experience. But it had heart, it had character. And I became quite invested to the point where, as those years went on, I remember like very quietly, and I mean quietly because even if I found someone who happened to be, hey, I'm watching Unforgiven 2004 this weekend, they could give two fucks if NWA TNA was now going to become total nonstop action wrestling on Spike TV. But like, I remember those moments, and maybe it was the passion of those announcers, you know, Tanae and Don West, and you know, to an extent Borash as well. They had that scrappy, you know, media presence. They were on, you know, YouTube before anyone else was. But I felt like I was kind of, not necessarily on the boat with them, but I felt like I was cheering them on. I never really thought they could do what they were hoping to do. 
but I do remember being very, very excited for the ride along the way. It was a strange feeling in the early 2000s to have this sense that WWE is the only ticket in town, and yet by pure sheer force of will, there was this other company that was stitching together this strange patchwork quilt of the names that WWE simply did not want because they were too fucked up physically, mentally, politically, or they were just part of a scene that WWE had decided right then and there they were never going to be a part of. kind of knew when I was watching AJ Styles with Sports Entertainment Extreme swinging a chainsaw around going after Disco Inferno thinking he may be one of the best wrestlers in the world but this ain't going to be what's going to get him to the dance anytime soon. But, you know, I was hooked. And I was as hooked by the ups as I was by the lows. Every time they took a step forward... And I would see people online criticizing they were taking two steps back. I always took it very personally. I felt that them going onto Spike TV, it should have been the greatest moment in wrestling since the Attitude Era had ended. And yet it felt like their victories were always mired with struggles. And that made it compelling. You know, so compelling because as the audience matured alongside those young guys, you saw, I remember seeing like, you know, Christopher Daniels and Chris Saban, you know, Frankie Kazarian, these guys when they were fresh-faced little boys in the early days of TNA, and then seeing them kind of slowly adopt this mantle, it kind of felt like they were making the company theirs. And then comes the heartbreak and the absolute watchability of Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan taking over. I know I'm playing fast and loose with the timeline here, folks, but... Again, you know, I want wrestling to make me feel stuff. And I felt a whole lot of shit going on in 2010 when those lads took over that company. It felt like, I don't know, when I was a teacher, it felt like kind of the situation where you had a class that you liked. Maybe they weren't the best achieving class in the world, but you understood them. And you didn't want someone else coming in and teaching them how to do things because you knew your way was best. And I just always got that feeling with Bischoff and Hogan, you know, that they were going to do something wrong. And I remember watching it live, that first live <laughs> impact with all of Bubba the Love Sponge's yellow t-shirt wearing sycophants in the first few rows. Seeing Val Venus play strip poker with the beautiful people. See the Nasty Boys and Jimmy Hart show up and immediately introduce themselves as being active six-man tag team competitors. And I just thought, well, say what you will, but this is going to be fucking interesting. And it was for eight weeks or however long they went head to head interesting is the most generous thing I can say but you know my heart was broken in a very different way to how it was broken by the WWE at the time where I felt it had been a long war of attrition where they slowly kind of like no not John Cena and Randy Orton that's not the attitude era but TNA it kind of felt like even when it was breaking my heart in those days they managed to whether it was the wrestlers themselves or the creative kind of slipping through the cracks. But it always felt like, much like WCW when it was with NWO, it felt like a company that was at war with the worst elements of itself. It felt like within this diamond that had been crudded with layers upon layers of rough, there was still a shiner in there. There was still this amazing wrestling company. If you just gave Samoa Joe his moment, or Kurt Angle a chance just to run with it, or let AJ Styles do his thing, or let the women's division, that was honestly, you know... Even when WWE was giving you Playboy pillow fights, they were giving you better women's wrestling in TNA. And when WWE decided they were going to clean up the act and give you Divas championships and butterfly belts and no more risque content, they were running fucking circles around them. You know, Gail Kim, Taryn Terrell, Awesome Kong, to name but a few. You know, God, I remember watching Daphne in some of those hardcore wars she had with Taylor Wilde thinking, my God... No one's ever let women do this in America on wrestling television. So, like, I felt I was always there for those moments. Those moments of, like, anguish and those moments of triumph. And even during the darkest times, I remember, you know, that period of time after Hogan and Bischoff were gone. And it felt like every other week there was someone new who had a master plan that was going to save TNA. Whether it was Billy Corgan or Anthem or whatever small local cable access television that was going to try and you know snap them up and right the course of the ship i did kind of fall out of contact with tna in the last few years and you know i think the thing that made me happiest was that it rose from the ashes of the pandemic 
as one of the companies that was doing things well. And it seems to have found itself a new life as the place where wrestlers want to go if they've got something new they want to try or they've got a skill set they want to improve upon. And I'm very happy to jump in and out of TNA, Impact Wrestling, whatever you want to call it these days, mainly because it is one of the only places that is trying to be that, a proving ground of sorts, as opposed to desperately trying to be number three, like so many other companies in its place are. And I do appreciate that the guys running it there, the bones of that old TNA, of Team Canada, Scott Demore, whatever you want to call it, that's still there. It always strikes me anytime I'm doing an episode of How To Wrestling or the Attitude podcast, and for whatever reason, we take a trip down to TNA and watch something a little bit out of the comfort zone, how all my co-hosts are always like, wow, this show is really weird and really different. And I always kind of smile to myself going, I'm not even going to attempt to explain the charm right now because I failed to do it in around 10 minutes here. And I feel until I actually sit down and actually review some of it myself, it will always be that mysterious promotion that kind of was the engine that could, did, but absolutely didn't. It had ideas way bigger than the company ever could be. And it was kind of pitched by a lot of self-proclaimed geniuses in wrestling to be their vision whether it be Jeff Jarrett, Vince Russo, or one of the many other people who had their fingers in the pie of TNA over the years. I think the day I realised that we could finally be nostalgic for TNA was absolutely a golden one indeed. And I'm so happy that you guys are doing such a great job covering this with the love and attention and care that it deserves. Because I think that TNA is something that's legacy is actually strangely more complex than even those of us who were there along for the ride could truly appreciate godspeed tna here's to 20 more because god knows it's proven at this point if there's one thing this company will do it is survive the years in the world of wrestling